Hello and welcome to my presentation on the Patterson project. Um, it's taken a little bit of time to put this information together, but thank you to everybody that was encouraging me on the LSE share chat board. Um, hopefully you find this of some value and you learn something. Without further ado, we will get started. So just a quick disclaimer, I am an individual that owns shares in the company Great and Gold who is exploring in this region. The presentation does not constitute any adv investment advice. If you want investment advice, uh, please contact a financial advisor with the relevant qualifications. Uh, some statements may include forward projections and predictions and even hypotheses about the information uh, on some of the slides. Historical performance is not a reliable indicator for future performance. Please conduct due diligence and your own research before investing in any company or product. And wherever possible, I have attempted to use the most recent data and most reliable sources. However, some data may change in the future. So Australia, we all know it. It's the world's 14th largest economy in 2019. And up until this year, actually, had 28 years of consecutive growth, which is better than pretty much any Western economy. Um, so it's a very stable uh, economy and it's a very geopolitically stable country in general to operate in, which is not always the case when we're looking at um, mineral companies and, and especially like those that operate out of Africa, for example. Um, the government is very favourable towards the basic materials and energy sectors, and that's because essentially the commodity industry um, makes up a significant part of the Australian economy. And as such, it attracts both internal investment and direct foreign investment. And that's illustrated here on this slide where you can see that 58% of all Australian export merchandise is actually mineral commodities, so over half. And of that, 18% is iron ore because, well, as you can see on the left here, um, Australia is the lead producer of iron. It has the largest resource of iron in the world. Um, they supply China and Japan, which makes the world steel with an abundance of iron ore. Um, they are also the top producers of lithium, which is quite a surprise to me. Um, but that's also very important for Australia looking towards the future where essentially electric vehicles and in general, the electrification of the planet is going to be um, something that's going to be coming our way. So lithium is pretty much the, dot, uh, the major metal for that future. It's also a lead producer of bauxite, which is an aluminium ore. Gold is in second place, but it actually has the largest resource of gold in the, in the world and is the focus of this presentation. And other metals such as lead and zinc, and you can see others in, in this report if you really want to. But the point is, is that commodities are really um, one of the, the, the vertebrae of the uh, Australian economy. And that's further illustrated here, where if you take a look into the top right here, the mining and the manufacturing side, when you combine the two amounts, it's 12.7% of the real gross value of the uh, Australian economy in 2017 and 18. And if you go on the Australian website, that is now uh, upwards of 16%. So it's growing, which means very good news for us, um, very good news for any explorers in the region. So this slide has been put together mainly to show you the link between um, essentially uh, metal, metal occurrences, uh, not just gold, but any metal occurrence, really, with um, these old pieces of land known as cratons. So in Australia, we have a couple of major ones, um, the main ones being the uh, Yilgarn craton over here and the uh, Pilbara in this zone over here. Now. What we can see on the right hand side is that wherever we have these cratons, we tend to have these gold occurrences associated both within them and at the margins, um, which is going to help any exploration company when they're looking to explore for new and uh, potentially significant mines. Um, they're not going to be exploring in here. Or perhaps in here. Or, or like over here, something like that. And the reason for that is because essentially we don't have these orogenic belts there. We don't have these cratons in those regions. Um, so this is where we explore for gold and all over the world, um, in, for, in the likes of Canada and the likes of South Africa, mineralization tends to be focused in cratons or at cratonic margins. This is a zoomed in version of the area we're gonna be focusing on, which is the Patterson or origin. Um, 
this is a geological map of Western Australia. You can find this online. Um, don't worry about the complexities of it. I know geological maps can be pretty um, confusing, but we'll go through this in a really simple, simple manner. So in the top left, we have our geological column essentially split into the eons from Archaea and Tophanerozoic, which I will go to over in a, in a little bit. But in essence, to describe it very briefly, we have the Pilbara craton here. This is, is essentially Archean in age, uh, very, very old. Um, this borders the Patterson area round about here. And the Patterson is anywhere from Paleoproterozoic in age all the way up to uh, Neoproterozoic in age, where we basically have our gold mineralization in there. Um, and that's all overlain by the more recent sediments which consist of anywhere from sort of Ordovician in age, Permian definitely, all the way through to more recent sediments. And just in case you don't know what I'm talking about, this is the geological column. It's well worth if, you, if your time, if you are first of all interested in, in just earth sciences, but also if you're looking, if you are an investor or looking to invest in any sort of geologically based company, it is worth your time to know your geological periods. But in essence, the Pilbara Craton here is in the Archean. Uh, the basement rocks of the Patterson are hosted in the Paleoproterozoic, which is about 2 billion years old. The mineralization in the Patterson origin and the host rocks are in the Neoproterozoic, so anything younger than about a billion years old. And then all of the recent sediments are mainly Permian in age, which is, is essentially 300 million years. So the geological history um, a little, in a little bit more depth and this map here is quite a nice simplistic um, view of the Patterson specifically. So what we have is a set of sort of large faults <coughs> here marked by the black lines on the map. We have the basement which is here called the Rudal complex and it consists of igneous and metamorphic rocks, quite high grade metamorphic rocks in fact. Um, some may have been continentally derived from the Pilbara, but in a sense, in essence, these have been dated at about 1.8 billion years. In general, the Patterson is part of a larger 2,000 kilometer uh, arcuate belt, so huge strike length uh, of this stretching eastwards. Um, we then overlay this uh, Rudal complex with what is known as the Yanina group sediments. And that's where our gold mineralization is hosted and then we intrude that and by intrude i simply mean a magmatic body passing up through those layers we intrude that with uh, these neoproterozoic uh, granites which may which i'll show you later kind of form an important part to our mineralizing system and then that's all overlain by a rather uninspiring and uh, boring set of sediments in the canning basin which are all phanerozoic in age and are appropriately termed the disappointment group. <laughs> I love the name. Um, this is just a sort of uh, time space correlation chart, it says, but essentially a geological column. I may draw out a, a better version of this in, in a future report slash presentation. Um, but all that needs to be shown really is at the bottom, we have the Rudal. I'll try and draw that. The Rudal are in the bottom. We then uh deposit on top of that uh the yanina group but this layer is unconformable which basically means there's been a huge time gap between the deposition of the rudal group and the yanina group and the yanina group is split up into two main groups the bottom half is known as the fossil group but the top half which is what we're interested in is known as the lamil group OK, and then this entire sequence has been intruded by these uh, granitic um, bodies, which is known as the O'Callaghan Super Suite. And then that's all overlain by the canning basing sediments up the top here. So the Lamel group is a four to five kilometer thick sequence of sandstone shell and carbonates. It's what we term a regressive sequence because by regression, we simply mean a drop in sea level. And when that happens, what we see is a coarsening upwards of the sediments and a cleaning upwards. And to define that, that simply means that we start with sort of finer grain sediments at the bottom of the sequence, moving upwards into our coarser grain sandstones and even potentially conglomeratic material um, at the top. 
and that reflects a retraction of the sea level where we're starting to get into more continental environments, possibly even desert. And the cleaning upwards is almost a, is essentially a reflection of that, because if you're going from deeper marine type deposits, they are going to contain a lot of clay, a lot of clay, a lot of mud. We want, and if we are cleaning upwards, we're essentially cleaning all of that out. So we have clean sandstones, which traditionally is a very good sign. It's a very good reservoir for things like oil deposits. We want clean sands for those. And specifically for metalliferous deposits, we need the porosity. So good clean sandstones are always a good sign are always a good thing when it comes to economic geology um in the malu uh, court site or the malu group that's where we have our mineralization and at the contact between the malu and the punta punta formation and as i said not shown here these are intruded by undeformed fractionated granites so to go over the major tectonic events of just the uh, orogenic area we're in the, the patterson Way back in the uh, 1.8 billion years ago, we have this orogenic episode where we collide two continents, the Western Australian Craton and the North Australian Craton, and that thickens the crust at about 35 kilometres and actually kind of provides the route, if you like, for this um, this origin. And it's kind of coeval with something called the Capricorn origin. In essence, they're all kind of interlinked at that time period, and it's believed it stretches up to about 1.3 billion years although that date's slightly debated, but for our purposes, we will use it. Um, then we have a sort of quiet period where we have a nice stable craton, and then we begin to deposit the Yanina group sediments, and that is coincident with this breakup of um, a supercontinent known as Rodinia. So the supercontinent is when all the land masses on Earth are kind of coalesced together. Eventually, that has to break up, and that has been timed for this particular supercontinent at around about this age, and we start to get develop these intracratonic rifts, which is simply within a rift, we start to split apart the, the, the sort of uh, land. And when you do that, you create like a low, you create a deposition center, and you're starting to move the ground below sea level. Therefore, you're going to get a lot more marine input, you're going to get fluvial uh, or rivers start to develop, and you're developing your system to essentially start um, depositing the sedimentary material, as I explained earlier. Then you in 678 million years ago, um, you have, or roughly there or thereabouts, you have something called the Miles Orogeny, which is the most important tectonic event in the basin, because this is the event which is going to generate uh, the conditions for our gold mineralization. And the reason for that is it's the timing of when the granites come in, it's the timing of metamorphism, but specifically it's the timing of this process known as basin inversion. And basin inversion is an extremely important uh, process uh, worldwide, in fact, for no a number of deposit areas um, as being the sort of dominant uh, control on where mineralization occurs. Um, specifically, in fact, um, the Central African Copper Belt, this process is, is key to forming the huge copper deposits that are found in that region. And ironically, the Patterson is actually the Patterson origin is actually the least important. It seems here it seems to have reasonably low impact on the Lamel group, which is a good thing because it means we're not going to be remobilizing any of our sediment, uh, our metals, and we're not going to be destroying the potential mineralization that will be there from the Miles erogenary. And this is just another set of maps, uh, a sort of uh, research on the Patterson in a bit more detail from a recent paper by Dave Houston, who is a um, geological survey of Western Australia um, staff member. Uh, here we can see in the Telfer region, um, the deposits are hosted in something called the Malu Formation. <clears throat> These have been intruded by Neoproterozoic granites and uh, confined essentially this 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 deposit or this region is confined by two pretty large fault systems um this diagram on the right is essentially all of the geochronological geochron information we have not only on the ore deposit but on a lot of the rock types around the area so this is how we know the ages of the deposits this is how we know the ages of the mineralization in fact geochronology in general is pretty much our best tool at dating any event in earth history and where I've put the green circle is essentially the date of the mineralization at Telfer. We can see that it's at a rough age of around about 650 million years, which is coincident with the uh, Miles orogeny and the emplacement of granites. Uh, a quick note, 
the host rocks, the Malu formation, are within this period over here, which is over 800 million years. So there's a nice 200 million lag time between the deposition of the Malu and, and the Yanina group and the actual timing of mineralization. Um, it's important that you define that. It's important when you're looking at ages of, of, of anything, really, that you know what it's relevant to. So to summarise, you have a continental collision between the North Australia Craton and the West Australia Craton between 1.8 and 1.3 billion years ago. This kind of creates the uh, sort of root of the origin itself. We then have a stable period and then at around about a billion years ago, we start to break up Rodinia and deposit the Yanina group sediments in that time frame. And this is going to be our host rock. The Miles Orogeny is the most important tectonic event in the region because it deforms the stratigraphy and generates basin inversion and also helps to emplace the intrusive granites into the region which precede the Patterson origin. So I just want to quickly go over some controls on gold mineralization and in general sort of provide an overview of why it is that gold deposits and a lot of metal deposits worldwide are very rare occurrences. So the reason why is because you need a lot of parameters to line up at the right time in a specific area. So I'm going to use the sort of geolo uh, the oil sort of model where we have a source of reservoir and a seal. So we need a source of your metal, the source of gold. It could be something like, I don't know, a granite, it could be a um, in the sediments, it could be in the crust. I mean, there needs to be a source of gold that is available to the region. You then need to be able to transport that gold, so you need the right fluid composition. Um, maybe it's a deep basinal brine, maybe it's some um, sort of heated up uh, hydrothermal fluid or meteoric water. You then need to be at that fluid needs to be able to scavenge that metal out into the fluid. That fluid needs a pathway, so usually you need the right structural geology, so things like faults and fractures, uh, maybe the right porosity and permeability of strata. You then need to change the geochemical conditions to be able to then deposit that gold in a suitable host rock, usually a good sandstone, possibly a uh, even, it can obviously um, occur in some igneous rocks, some shales as well. Um, and then we usually need to seal that in place, either with maybe some form of cap rock. But the main thing that will keep it in place really is a, is a sort of close, sort of no change to the geochemical conditions, but the absence of destructive events, so a lack of remobilization. And then sometimes we actually need to upgrade the uh, grade because it's all well and good putting it there, but if it's not the right grade, it's not economic. So sometimes you need super gene enrichment, which are sort of uh, near surface processes that can upgrade the uh, content, the grade. And all of this needs to happen over time, which maybe perhaps explains why some of these pre Cambrian terrains, these cratons, actually contain such a lot of metal content because we have a long period of time and a lot and a good greater chance of all of these events lining up, and also a longer time for us to keep upgrading the metal content. And this is a quick, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I just wanted to point out um, the different tectonic settings that are associated with specific deposit types. I've got a lot of terms here if you want to pause and read up and just quickly familiarise yourself with them. But the main thing we're going to be focusing on is these two here, the continental arc and the accreted terrains. So traditionally what happens is your oceanic plate subducts beneath the continental plate. We start generating melts, we start generating um, uplift, and we start to accrete land masses onto the side of others. And what this is going to do is it starts, it's going to thicken the continent, which is going to obviously increase the pressure and temperature at depth. We're going to get a lot of intrusions. We're potentially going to have precursory magmatic activity, which will have put metals into the rock, which means any fluids that enter this system or any pre-existing fluids, if they get heated up, they might be able to scavenge these metals and put them up higher up which is where we, it's in these environments, which we get the orogenic gold type deposit, some porphyry copper and gold, some epithermal copper, uh, some epithermal gold, should I say. And it's these uh, that I believe that essentially that are deposit type, uh, um, Telfer and our deposit type, uh, Haviron is uh, located in, we're located in a continental arc slash accreted terrain. So on to Newcrest Mining, it's Australia's biggest miner, blue chip miner, 21.41 billion dollar market cap 
Um, this is a slide from one of their presentations showing that they have the right technology to explore for different levels of deposits. Um, they operate in multiple countries and their significant discoveries um, are renowned in sp specifically Lahir and Kadia. If you do want to look them up, they are massive deposits. So you know you're in safe hands when it comes to Newcrest entering into a joint venture partnership, which is what Great and Gold have got with them. So onto the Telford deposit, it's 100% owned by Newcrest. Uh, it's been in production since about 1975. Uh, more than 10 million ounces of gold has been produced since inception uh, in 1977 um, at that point. Um, 5.4 million ounces left as of uh, 2019. That does actually not include reserves. 452,000 ounce production last year. So if you do the maths, it works out a 12 years mine life at the moment based on those statistics. Um, so it's still got some legs in it and it's um, the largest neo proterozoic mine in the world. So looking at the geology, we noticed that it's hosted in the Malu group, which is in the Lamel group. Um, just to explain, the, this is like the this is the group name. This is the sort of over, sort of bigger term. And then this is the Malu group is a member of that group. As I said, they're near proterozoic in age and so is the mineralization. We have a series of parallel veins, which is known as reefs, sheeted vein mineralization and stock work. We've got Traditionally, the fluids are thought to be a mixture of hydrothermal and metamorphic input, and that the gold source is actually in the sediments themselves, possibly even sourced from the basement. And as I said, there's a debate over the granites. And this diagram here just shows you the geometry of the deposit, whereby we have the uh, deposit hosted within the Malo group, which is in these colourful units in the centre of these anticlinal bodies. Now, anticlines, if I draw it out, it look like this where we have layers and layers of rock. The rocks this side would dip this way, so, and then the other ones would dip that way. And then at the center is the oldest rocks. So these rocks over here are older than the rocks on the outside of it, okay? And that is essentially where our gold mineralization is hosted. So a bit more depth, I'd really recommend you go to Porter Geo. It's a great website uh, for numerous deposits, but especially Australian ones. Um, this is just a replication of that diagram, but this uh, sort of bit on the right kind of shows you where the mineralization is, and it's occurring in these kind of stratiform reef-like uh, deposit layers, okay? Um, we have a series of pictures here on the right, actually, from a more recent work, and you can see that there's very different styles of mineralization that occur at Telford, but the one I want to draw attention to is kind of this one over here, which is a breccia. Now it's well known that we have a breccia zone that's mineralized at Haviron, and uh, breccias look like this, where we have these angular chunks solidified within the rock. It's kind of a textural characteristic, but in between we have this matrix of more of like a finer grained material. In this example, it looks to me like it's more of like a, a carbonate, maybe even the quartz uh, material. And this, it, it, these are mineralized at Telfer, but they appear to be mineralized at Haviron as well, which is a really good sign. So just going over a model of formation, uh, there are a couple of competing ideas, but the general consensus is that we have um, an intrusive body that's a granitic, usually. Um, this granite will, ex will give off heat. So any pre-contained fluids, metamorphic fluids, in this um, in this part of the stratigraphy, will start to generate circulation. Possibly the granites give off uh, fluids themselves that will mix. These fluids will take out the copper and the um, gold from the sediments, and along the basement faults and any other faults in the system, it will move up and start to deposit that material in the Malu formation, which is will be located here maybe because of a change of geochemical conditions, a few other chemical processes. Um, and that's essentially where we deposit those reef deposits. And the breccias would be associated with uh, essentially that process and a, a high temperature, uh, high salinity fluids usually. So the only debate is whether or not the granites are supplying metals. Or, uh, and or the fluids. Um, that's a more of an academic debate. Um, I've kind of just supplied this model from Rowan's, it's kind of um, 
I guess that I think is the easiest to understand. OK, but essentially the features of these models show that they are a bit of a hybrid between orogenic gold type uh, deposits with some porphyry features. And this is just a summary of Telfer. As I said, it's the largest neoproterozoic mine in the world. It's interpreted actually as intrusion related gold. It's kind of its own deposit class. There's a few examples worldwide given in this table here. Um, the the Telfer's at the top, so if you do want to read it, uh, go ahead. Um, but the main take home point is that the fluids in, in this piece of work by Schindler, they studied fluid inclusions and, and actually found that there's a lot of different fluid inclusion compositions within the Telfer that uh, are contributing to the uh, mineralizing system. Um, as I said, there's a debate over the role of granites, but in general, the Telfer shows characteristics of origin at Golden and a bit of porphyry systems too. Okay, moving on to Haviron. So Haviron is obviously Great and Gold's sort of um, project that they've entered into a, a Newcrest joint venture sh um, um, partnership with. Uh, Newcrest have moved on to stage three of that farming agreement where they can earn more of a percent of this particular deposit um, if they deliver a pre-feasibility study. There's been exceptional drill results since 2018 and I'm going to show you some of the latest ones on the next slide. But in essence, Telfer's over here. Haviron's only located about 35 kilometers towards the east, so pretty close by. So the geology will be pretty much the same. Um, in terms of the magnetics, uh, you can see this is a magnetic anomaly map of Austra Western Australia. We see warmer colors in this part here. So this would automatically make you want to go and explore in this area, which is exactly what Great and Gold did. And they delivered some drilling and this is their latest drill results. There is actually more pages, but this is just a quick excerpt. And what you see is you see really good gold grades, um, consistent gold grades above two gram per tonne. Some copper uh, grades over here commonly exceeding 0.3, 0 0.4%. But I suppose the most important thing is that the width of these uh, gold intercepts are, are also very large, including one that is, on this plot at least, 167.4 metres. Uh, there was an example that was over 200 metres as well at a slightly lower gold grade, but the point is really large, really high grade mineralized areas here at Haviron. And this plot on the right hand side is just a north, is a cross section where we have the Permian cover in pink. It, it says the basement sediments, which we know are neoproterozoic in age, and we have our breccia zone. Now, the breccia zone is where the mineralization is occurring alongside this what we are terming an arcuate sulfide zone now you can see in red these are the intercepts but what interests me on this plot is the presence of what is here called the post mineral dike now i don't know the composition of that it could be a mafic dike which is more basaltic in composition or it could be a felsic dike which is granitic i'd like to know the answer to that but well, I'd also like to know, it says it, it looks like it terminates against the Permian, so we know it's younger than that as well. It'd be good to know what age this is. It would also be good to know the composition. It'd be good to know the relationship, actually, of the ore to this dike, because that's going to have implications on the deposit model. If this is granitic in composition, this is pretty much kind of analog, very analogous to, to Telfer. Um, there's also the implications that this could add more heat to the system, it could bring in more metals, it might not, it might be barren, but there's also the potential that this could be causing the actual brecciation zone, which um, a lot of people have been invoking breccia pipes as a, a model in the, in the LSE share chat. Um, from my um, initial research, there's no evidence to suggest that. Um, there's no evidence of breccia pipes in this particular region. However, there are some features that are to take note of the overall shape of the Haviron and the presence of this dike that could be feeding uh, this system here and could actually be the cause of some of the brecciation. It's worth it's worth further investigation. I'm looking into the breccia pipes, but my own interpretation is, is that that is less likely than likely. And here we have um, an example of some of that brecciation here on the last slide of the recent May 2020 presentation where the mineralization that seems to be occurring around these breccia clasts. So clearly we've had some form 
of uh, event that's caused the breccia and then we've put in the mineralization that's filling in the matrix around all the way around this breccia that could be being supplied by that post mineral diet it could be just the generic telfer model where we're circulating fluids and putting them in here um it's again it's a very uh, Im important question to ask with regards to the deposit model and on the left hand side here we have the intersections the red showing the intercepts we've got mineralization in this arcuate sulfide zone and in the recent presentation by Callum Baxter it appears like they finished up map, uh, mapping this and then they've got um, the breccia zone marked on as well um, which is still open at depth and open to the northwest so when they do drilling in the northwest they're hopefully going to constrain the deposit a little bit further and um, provide us a real estimate on what potentially they have here so just to summarize excellent drill results of high grade gold mineralization over significant length the mineralization is still open at depth in the northwest geology is very similar to telfer and proximal to the mine so essentially i'm saying that this this have your on is is another telfer deposit potentially um in terms of tonnage we don't know but the model seems to have a lot of similarities i just want to know about that post mineral dike and whether it has any additional heat or me uh, metalliferous benefit to the system and hopefully i get an answer uh, so scanniwag um this is just a, a sort of diagram showing the geophysical responses you can clearly see haviron sticks out like a sore thumb it's a bullseye magnetic anomaly over here and we see a repetition of those features over here on the left at, specifically at blackbeard and at kraken um, and also some work done prior to that or alongside that um, we also done some they also done some uh, copper or some geophysical not geophysical geochemical uh, sampling and um, uh, produced uh, over 300 and 350 um, part per billion results which is very um, important in terms of signifying whether or not we have a mineralized system at depth um, geophysical responses is, is good um, and so is the soil sampling what we need is drill results and hopefully they're on the way soon and just recently there's been another discovery further north of us actually at the we knew discovery it's called the we knew discovery um, this is the recent um, results if we're going to get egotistical about it our gold grades are better than theirs um, but they do have very good lengths at say 155 and 104 and to be honest the more discoveries there are in this region the, it can only increase the excitement and the prospectivity of this region which has been ranked number one you saw in the recent may 2020 presentation that the patterson is kind of the go-to destination for mining at the moment and what we're seeing is an increase in discoveries even i think antipa reported so uh, uh, some up an updated on results i haven't read it yet but i think it was positive in their exploration efforts so it's just it could be that this region in general the patterson has just been underexplored for whatever reason maybe due to a lack of investment a lack of interest because there's so many good districts worldwide and if you find a good deposit in one of those regions you're likely to focus on it um and now you know companies are coming in and they're finding things here and it could be the next the new rave if you like and this is just the the, the drill holes of the Wienu discovery again permian cover basement sediments in the neoproto zerk and some layers here in the middle um which looks very similar to what uh, we're getting at the other discoveries at telfer and also at um Haviron. um so it'll be interesting to see how this develops as well so in conclusion the patterson region is a currently active and highly prospective metalliferous district the proterozoic origenic episodes often are often sites of significant mineralization not just in australia but worldwide um, the telford deposit and haveron prospects show strikingly similar characteristics uh, scallywag has good geophysical responses that are very similar to haveron as well and that the rio tinta discovery further north further enhances patterson potential um, so overall very good signs i'm hoping that we get uh, new results coming out for scallywag very soon um, and hopefully you found this presentation useful um, i've left the list of references at the end here i do plan on writing up a bit more of a detailed uh, report this is kind of the first presentation i've done on this and i'm a pretty new investor to, to this area and so my research has obviously been restricted by time but as time goes on hopefully i'll be able to put more out there um, 
obviously I'm a PhD student, so I shouldn't really get on with that. But I guess this is a kind of side hobby. So, you know, um, I left my contact details at the start of the presentation. So if you want the copies of the academic papers I've used, um, contact me and I'll send you a copy. Other than that, thank you for listening and see you guys later.